Madison. For those who don't know, I'm publisher of Saltwater Boat Angling. And this is a little program that we've made about black bream, one of my favorite sport fish. They don't grow very big, but boy, do they give anglers a lot of great sport. I'm lucky enough to live in a part of the country where the bream fishing can be really excellent. When the days begin to lengthen, I always start thinking about when we can get out fishing for these toothy critters again. Black bream are the only finned fish to have been responsible for the designation of a marine conservation zone. And this has come about because of the way that they breed. But I'll go into that in more detail later. Since we're all locked down because of the COVID-19 virus, and we can't actually do any fishing, I thought it'd be a good idea to remind anglers what these fine little fish have to offer. So let's look at tactics, tackle, bait, and other things that anglers use to catch them. Uh, bream are, by and large, a shoalfish, and when you find them, they will attack baits with vigor and in numbers. They have small mouths and sharp cutting teeth, which means that small hooks are best, with relatively light tackle. Even when fishing over a wreck, you don't need heavy duty tackle, and the bream will very often be above the wreck rather than in it. When you come across them on rough ground or rocky ground, by using rig which keep the hook clear of the bottom, you can get away with remarkably light tackle as well. There are three popular rigs which anglers use for bream fishing. I favour a simple two or three hook paternoster, but Portland rigs are very popular, and these consist of a sliding hook length with bead stoppers coming horizontally off the main trace. A type of sliding bolt rig which allows the bait to helicopter in the tide and they're very popular. Wishbone rigs are also popular, and that's a two hook rig tied like a dropper below the lead, often running on a trace. They're very deadly, particularly when the fish are feeding indiscriminately. As for rods and reels, I use a fixed spool reel and a long rod. My favorite one's an Artico, but a tubertini or similar with a flexible tip will work. Uh, my reel is loaded with braid, which I find much easier to use for this type of fishing. Sometimes with a short uh, leader length of mono, especially if you're fishing in rough, rough ground or on a wreck. I like to ground bait, particularly uh, when I'm fishing in uh, rocky venues like the Kingmere or West Country Reefs at Anchor. Uh, so putting down ground bait will greatly increase your chances. Uh, my favourite way is to mash up fish and breadcrumbs and freeze it in a bag or a small bucket. Uh, the point about freezing it is it will release particles slowly as the block melts, allowing a gradual stream of particles to drift down tide. This will keep the fish coming to you for much longer. As far as bait is concerned, black bream will eat almost anything. Uh, they're very Catholic feeders. My favourite bait is um, squid, but they can be taken on worms or crab baits or anything else really. I use small strips of squid, mainly because it's tough and it'll stay on the hook for longer. Sometimes bream are feeding so hard, you don't really need to worry too much about getting the techniques right. And there is really a, a skill to fishing for bream, uh, which will bag you more and bigger fish. Firstly, uh, when you're at anchor, you need to really have a t reasonable tide run, just enough to hold the bottom. And I like to trot my lead down tide and hold my rod, feeling for bites. The reason a long rod with a sensitive tip works is because the bite detection is better and knowing when to strike can be really important. A long rod is also helpful if you're fishing on the side of an anchored boat and it allows you to trot down tide keeping away from all your other rods. Black bream are unusual for fish in UK waters. They're what we call protogynous. Uh, they start off life as females, and most of the population, when they get to about 35 centimetres, turn into males. Their arrival in the UK spawning grounds in March and April is detected by the excavations that they make on the seabed, and these are created by male fish. They use their tail and their mouth, uh, and each male can shift about 70 or 80 kilograms of sand, gravel, pebbles, and cobbles to reveal the hard rock underneath. The excavated material forms a kind of rampart around the nest and becomes the male's territorial boundary. Uh, where the nests are dense, the seabed is like a moonscape. Black bream tend to favour areas where the hard bedrock is only covered by a thin layer 
of fine gravel or sand, which is why places like the Kingmere Rocks in Sussex is such a favourite area for them. The very name black bream is in itself a little bit misleading. For the large part, both males and females are silver, as we know. It is only during stressful or exciting events such as territorial displays, fights or during courtship that the fish will change colour. It takes place in a few seconds and they become very dark, totally black indeed, with one or more vertical bright white stripes on this side. It's quite easy to tell the difference between the male and the female fish during the breeding season. The male on the left has got a beautiful azure stripe across its nose, uh, whereas the female remains quite dull and grey. Now, male black bream keep their nest exquisitely clean and tidy while they entice their females down to mate. Big males tend to have bigger nests and may attract several different females. Good housekeeping and looking hot for the ladies aren't all a male black bream has to do. In the early days of nest building, territorial disputes are all too common uh, and there have been vicious fights witnessed uh, using underwater cameras between males to win or defend nests before eggs are spawned. Such fights can result in scale loss or even chunks being bitten out from their fins. A female attracted to a male in his nest will inspect the nest surface, feeling it with her mouth and fins and belly. The male fish swims busily around her, nuzzling her, encouraging her to stay. Once the eggs are spawned and fertilised, the male keeps them clean and stands guard over them until they hatch. This can take about two weeks. During this time, the male rarely feeds unless, of course, food floats past. He has to maintain the nest structure and defend the eggs against all would-be predators, including snails, slugs, crabs, starfish, urchins, wrasse, gobies, and even other bream. If a male leaves a nest for more than a minute, hungry predators will waste little time in moving in to feed on the eggs. And a male returning to find an imposter has no hesitation in making his displeasure known. The actions to remove them is very swift. Footage that's been taken from Pool Bay uh, of a nest with an absent male shows over 40 gobies, rasp, bib, juvenile bream and others all feasting on the egg. The rate of predation is very rapid and nest, nest eggs could easily disappear in a matter of hours. So long as the male remains on the nest, the eggs are highly likely to survive. After the hatch, the larvae take their chances in the plankton and the prevailing currents for a month or so. They tend to aggregate above the, the reef. When the young reach maturity, about three or four centimetres in late summer, they arrive in nursery areas like seagrass, meadows, reefs, algae habitats and other areas, mainly inshore. Black bream are at their most vulnerable during the breeding season, both to commercial fishing and recreational angling as well. Large aggregations of fish can be decimated by trawlers and sometimes by anglers if proper controls on breeding sites are not put in place. In Sussex, for instance, the designation of the Marine Conservation Zone on the Kingmere Rocks has at least given the fish some kind of respite during the breeding season. Uh, on the Kingmere, there's currently a four fish bag limit per angler uh, during the breeding season. Uh, and this prevents what I call fishmongering when boatloads of anglers indiscriminately take hundreds of fish for the pot. In reality, most anglers will observe both bag and minimum size limits because they know that taking too many big males can have a dramatic effect on the breeding population. It's fine to take the odd trophy fish, but now that most people have digital cameras on their phones, it's increasingly unnecessary. In any case, as far as I'm concerned, better fish for the pot tend to be uh, smaller ones, larger females maybe, or, or some of the smaller males. Some of the best fishing for bream can be found on wrecks and in deeper water marks out of the breeding season, September, October, and even into November. And indeed, the British record, which was caught on a wreck from Plymouth by John Garlick in 1977, weighed a massive six pounds, 14 ounces, and that fish has never been bettered. These little fish are a precious part of the marine ecosystem, and it makes sense to return almost all of the fish that we catch. Having said all this, we still don't know the effect catching bream around breeding sites has on the overall breeding strength. There's evidence that males caught on their nests while guarding eggs will, if returned, go back to the same place. 
Uh, but even a few minutes of being hauled up 15 metres or so and then unhooked could be enough time to decimate the nest. So we anglers need to keep an open mind about conserving these habitats and be rigorous in, in observing agreed restrictions. The Angling Trust has been instrumental in helping maintain access for anglers in marine conservation zones uh, where finned fish, and particularly bream, are the primary designated species. In Sussex, they worked with the IFCA and other stakeholders, including commercial fishermen, to get the best deal for everyone. As the designation for the Kingmere is now up for review, the Trust will continue to fight the corner of recreational anglers and the charter boat fleet based in Sussex.